In the Democratic Republic of Congo, local officials say suspected Islamist rebels killed at least 38 people in an overnight attack in an eastern village. It's the latest in a spike of violent clashes that began in February. Since 1996, fighting in the region has led to about 6 million deaths. Ali Rogan has more. Two prominent rebel factions in the region are the March 23 movement, or M23, and the so-called Allied Democratic Forces, or ADF. Neighboring Rwanda has been accused of supporting M23, which the government denies. And the ADF is a militia group affiliated with the Islamic State and are blamed for the latest attack. They are just two of the more than 120 groups operating in the region vying for interests, including control over the country's rich reserves of metals and rare minerals. Civilians have been caught in the middle, and the Congolese government has often failed to protect them. According to the United Nations, the violence has displaced 5.7 million people across the provinces of North Kivu, South Kivu, and Ituri. Jada Doyen McKenna is the CEO of Mercy Corps, a nonprofit group providing humanitarian aid on the ground. Jada, thank you so much for being here. This is an extremely complex conflict, but what are some of the root causes behind the violence that we're seeing now? Yeah, the, the root causes, uh, you mentioned some of them, this control. This is a vastly mineral-rich country in a lot of ways. So control of those, illegal mining, um, inter-ethnic groups, but also just lots of proxy wars between other actors, um, other countries, surrounding countries, ethnic groups. It just, at this point, there have been so many splinterings of conflict groups that um, it, the, the numbers just ballooned to over 120, we believe. Um, you just uh, recently visited this region. What is different about this conflict now? Um, has it gotten worse? I recently was in uh, Goma, which is the largest area in the North Kivu province. province. And since January, um, over 700,000 more people have been displaced into Goma. And what's particularly happening now is that the rebel groups have choked off all access to Goma. So they're surrounding areas, 10 to 15 kilometers, just outside of the city, and they've choked it off. So food prices have gone up. It's made it hard for things to go in and out. Um, and they are now, that their weaponry has gotten so sophisticated that they're able to send bombs and other things into um, displacement camps where people that they've been displaced. So it's just this, this real level of concentrated um, fear and threat that, that people are facing right now. What stuck out to you the most? The thing that stays in my mind as, as I talk to the people, and even as I talk to my own staff, as I mentioned, we've had staff, staff members are kind of, they're subject to this violence. They have family that are displaced. It's just the incredible resilience of people. Um, I met a woman who's like sewing little doilies and, and table things and trying to sell her wares on the street. Like they, people want better for their children. They want to get back to normal. Um, and, and they very much um, are talented and, and want to be able to live productive lives. And, and just the incredible resilience of the people of the DRC really bl blows me away. And where are most of these people who have been displaced coming from? Are they are they from internally or are they from other countries? It's almost it's almost all internally displaced people. Um, one of my colleagues said at one point he was hosting up to 50 relatives who had been displaced. And so you'll often hear stories of people who've like moved. They started with relatives, then they've moved to a camp, and their camp is full, and so now they're in an area outside of a camp. So it really is people just forced to flee their homes, looking for a way to survive. I want to play a bit of sound from a mother of six who was displaced by the conflict. Bombs are still falling in the camp here and in other camps. Several people have died and we live here with fear. May God help us so that the war ends and people return to their respective areas. Can you tell us a little more about the conditions and the perils that people in these camps face? These are very crowded places, um, very little electricity, uh, really tough access to water, uh, uh, clean uh, hygiene. Um, the poverty, just because people have now been forced from their livelihoods, um, also just makes people, they're, they're hungry, they don't have access to, to running water, it's not safe. Um, and particularly women and children are feeling the brunt of, of being in these crowded conditions. Why is it that women and children are the most vulnerable here? I think this happens in situations of chaos, right? You have a lot of people that are forced into very crowded crowded situations um, amongst people that they, they may not know, women um, having to leave their homes for work and economic opportunities. Um, it's just very easy for them to take get taken advantage of um, in terms of gender and sexual-based violence. Um, and they're really, you know, it, it's, it's everyone, right? It could be someone who is your neighbor in a displacement camp or someone you go into the city to try to get work or 
or, or try to get food. And um, unfortunately, um, they seem like easy targets and they are just being really taken advantage of. At this point, do we know, uh, at this point, have there been many reports of instances of sexual violence? Yes, many. And in fact, when you visit these areas, the women and the men are talking about it and talking about And I also, um, like in groups, you'll see um, women, that really that are children or girls, you'll see a lot of pregnant um, young people and, and you know that that's what's happening. But, but they are actively talking about it and, and feeling um, just very vulnerable and very taken advantage of in this moment of time. And how about the Congolese government? What has their role been and how effective have they been in addressing the violence? You know, the Congolese government um, has, has not been as effective as it should have been. We desperately need them to come to p the peace talks that are being organized through Angola and Luanda. We definitely need them to come to some kind of ceasefire or truce with these rebel groups. Um, but clearly the people we'd meet in the camps would say that they're not doing enough. You know, as, as long as people are displaced and, and as vulnerable as they are and just feeling like they have nowhere to go, they're going to feel like the government's not doing enough. And there has there has been some political flux in recent months. Has that affected the ability of the Congolese government to to address this effectively? Certainly, uh, obviously, like any instability, does not help the situation at, at all. And so, just it's another factor that that is pulling at them and and preventing people from really addressing what's going on. What fundamentally needs to change to stop this violence long term? And what is the role of the international community? What is the role of humanitarian organizations in achieving that? We need a real coming together of a peace process um, with with pressure to bear on neighboring countries. All the parties to this war like really need to come together and political and diplomatic pressure has to be put on everyone uh, to do their part to do this. We also need to just help people in the humanitarian situations they're facing. On top of all this violence, we've also, um, we've also seen record rainfall um, in some areas, droughts and others, all related to climate related disasters. So we need to get basic infrastructures back up and running, um, help support people, but, but really this peace process so that people can return to their homes and, um, and, and have a chance of living productive lives. Jada Doyen McKenna, CEO of Mercy Corps, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for talking about this.